Are there any questions without, are there any questions without notice? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer the Acting Prime Minister to his speech to the Zionist Federation of Australia in May this year. Will he confirm to this House that it is Australian government policy that Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem should be closed down? Will he explain to the House the reasons for this decision? The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. <coughs> Mr Speaker, uh, again, I put, uh, this question I'll put to the Foreign Minister. Uh, because Order. This, uh, this, uh, Order. I know, I know. And, and the things happened since. And, uh, well, like the member for Koo Young will cease interjecting. And, uh, this is a sensitive issue, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, there are issues in uh, the, uh, uh, the matters which I referred to at the time, including, uh, including uh, the uh, role of the PLO in the Iraqi in the Iraqi invasion, uh, the, in their support of the Iraqi invasion, which I'm sure the Foreign Minister may, may wish to comment upon. And I'll refer it to him. The Honourable Member for Kennedy. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question without notice is directed to the Minister for Trade Negotiations. Can, uh, can he inform honourable members whether the new sugar imports regime authorised by the United States administration last Friday provides substantial liberalisation of the US sugar market? The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, I recognise the interest of the Honourable Member for Kennedy in uh, the uh, sugar program in the United States, and I've got to say with him I share very much the disappointment at the results of uh, last week's decision. Honourable Members will recall that Australia successfully challenged the United States system of sugar import quotas in the GATT last year and uh, the US was forced to look at its system in relation to sugar. The United States has now announced the introduction of a new regime, a tariff quota regime, to replace the system which was found to be GATT inconsistent. Under the tariff quota regime approved by President Bush last Friday, imports of up to an annually variable quota will enter the United States at duty rates of 0.625 cents per pound but amounts in excess of that quota will be subjected to a prohibitive tariff of 16 cents per pound. And I regret to say that this to us seems simply replacing one form of protectionism with another. It is simply a slate of hand. And the regime, the new regime, will produce the same practical effect as the existing GATT illegal regime. The quota for 1991 uh, has been set at 1.725 million tonnes, of which 137,710 tonnes have been allocated to Australia. Now, the government has conveyed to the United States its disappointment at this response. We see it as simply a cosmetic one, which fails to guarantee substantial ongoing improvements in access to the United States market. <coughs> Particularly unfortunate that the United States has chosen to defend a clearly trade-distorting policy when we are trying so hard to reduce the barriers of trade through the Uruguay Round. We are now waiting for the outcome of the 1990 Farm Bill to assess the full impact of the tariff quota regime on Australian interests and whether the new regime will be fully consistent with the GATT obligations of the United States. We will continue to press strongly for a more market-oriented United States sugar program. The evidence of the change is that Australian exports on sugar to the United States have fallen from 811,000 tonnes in 1981, before quotas were introduced, to 137,700 tonnes for 1991. And uh, it's estimated that the cost of US sugar policy to Australia is estimated at between $123 million and $313 million a year. Uh, before I call the Honourable Acting Leader of the Opposition, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon Mr Patrick Duffy MP, who is the President of the North Atlantic Assembly, and Mr David Hobbs, the Senior Director of the North Atlantic Assembly. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished visitors. Yeah. The Honourable the Acting Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer the Acting Prime Minister to a vote taken last evening in the Senate when the Labor Party senators voted with the Democrat, Democrats against an urgency motion 
to, to wit that in the opinion of the Senate the following is a matter of urgency. In view of the fundamental importance for the national interest of major microeconomic reform and noting that improved efficiency and greater competition are key elements of such reform, the need for the Senate to endorse the selling of shares in the Commonwealth Bank, Qantas and Australian Airlines. I ask the Acting Prime Minister why the Labor Party senators voted against this motion when it reflects accurately the policy decided upon by Cabinet, and that being put to the ALP Special National Conference on Monday. Has the government changed its policy on asset sales, or is this a case of a party that can't govern itself, can't govern the country? The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. It, it's, a, it's a party that doesn't respond to stunts by the coalition. That's what it is. It's not about a party that can't govern itself. The party, the party, uh, the Labor Party, has uh, has a process where policy is considered, and uh, you are all spectators in that process because it's a public one, uh, and you will be next Monday. Yes, we have a very. This is, as I said, the only mass party in Australia, the only real political party in the country, and uh, it's not a private outfit like your own. It's a. It's a full living, breathing mass party, and it, uh, it, has, uh, it has public processes. But, but really, why should, Labor senators, why should Labor senators respond to, uh, to uh, stunts by uh, the coalition to try and uh, have them preempt, preempt a position? A preempt a position? Well, well when, some of, some, when some of your performers are over there, certainly they're stunts. And, uh, and that uh, when this may preempt a debate which will ensue in our party. Now, once our party has made decisions on some of these issues and the matters are then brought by the cabinet properly to the caucus, when the caucus adopts positions on that, I'm quite certain then many caucus members in the Senate will, be, will feel qu completely relaxed about responding to some of these issues. But uh, they wouldn't be certainly be relaxed about responding to your stunts. So uh, if you get if you get if you get serious about Order. about the national issues facing the, 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 about the national issues facing this country and about the gravity of the issues, fine. But the thing is, you're basically stunt merchants, and that's why you're still Member over there, Bass. nearly a decade on. And the thing is, when are you going to wake up to yourselves? The honourable member for Grey. Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Science and Technology in his capacity uh, representing the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce. As the Minister is aware, my electorate includes the still city of Wyala. Is the Minister aware of recent comments concerning the asserted poor performance of the steel industry? And is he able to assure the House and my electorate that this important industry to the national economy is not in trouble? The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. I know of his uh, strong commitment to this industry, not only as a representative of it now, but as a uh, former employee of it, and of the fact that uh, during the recent election campaign I had the opportunity to campaign with him in sections of the industry um, in Wyala. I thank him for the opportunity to correct what has been, I think, a quite distorted statement that was made the other day by the uh, member for Warringah when he said in relation to Australia's steel industry, amongst other things, that all of the evidence at my disposal suggests that the government's steel industry plan, the industry itself and its workforce, fail to identify and achieve the real targets necessary to make BHP a viable operation by international standards. That was part of what he said. Now, let me say, Mr Speaker, that that type of statement may have been appropriate and indeed was appropriate in 1983 when this government came to power, because at that time the steel industry was facing a situation in which BHP said, BHP said it was considering withdrawing from the domestic steel industry and a number of options were canvassed by them, including the closure of Wyala and Newcastle. That was the inheritance that was left by the previous government in terms of its approach to the steel industry. By comparison to that, uh, Mr Speaker, what this government did when it came to power in 1983 was to develop a plan, an industry development strategy for the steel industry. 
It is a plan that operated between 1983 and 1988, and it was a plan that did not have to be maintained because the industry itself became self-sufficient and self-motivated in its continuation. What we saw was five years of a very successful building block for the future direction and future solidification of this industry. Mr. Um, or the Honourable Member for um, Warringah in his statement went so far as to say, and all of the evidence at my sub uh, disposal suggests, well, let me just give him some of the evidence that refutes his assertion that the industry has gone backwards and is not able to uh, compete by international standards. Because indeed, the major object of this government's steel industry plan, Mr. Speaker, was to ensure a viable, and, and I quote from the, uh, the report, a viable and internationally competitive steel industry in Australia, capable of providing competitively priced steel to downstream users and job security for the industry's employees. The tasks that were set for it and the achievements I list. In terms of investment, we have seen since 1983 $2.5 billion invested by BHP in the steel industry, and I am reliably advised that there will be a further billion dollars of uh, investment to be undertaken by a BHP. In terms of achieving efficiency, BHP is now the third lowest cost producer of steel in the world. In terms of productivity, we saw the unit uh, tonnes per employee per year rise from 180 under the previous government's administration in 1983 to over 400, a 125 per cent increase. In terms of research and development, we have seen significant exp um, expenditure by BHP to the extent to which last year it, uh, in, it, it uh, increased its expenditure by uh, $40 million. It now has 0.7 per cent of its sales invested in R&D, and that's the reason why it's putting new products on the market. Some 14 new steel building products were released onto the market, international markets, uh, last year. Industrial disputes have been brought down by an eighth, only one eighth the level that existed back in uh, the period of the Liberal government. And by far the most important direction of this strategy, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, is in relation to exports. The first quarter figures in the steel industry released yesterday showed that there had been a doubling of steel exports this year compared to last year. We have now, in the first quarter, over half a million um, tonnes in, um, in orders compared to in 1983-84 for a whole year of exports only 800,000. Exports now represent one third of production compared to one sixth of production. And in terms of the basic direction of industry, the direction in which we have to get industry going, of competing in international markets, of growing exports, it is a significant success. But by all those standards, Mr Speaker, the steel industry and BHP in particular has made significant progress. It's done it because it's had support. It's had an environment in which to operate that this government has provided, that the government on the other side couldn't provide, and, it, and provided that continues, this industry has a great future. And I'm in a position to indicate to the honourable member for, uh, for Wyala that so long as this strategy continues, and it will under our regime, then his people can be assured of a very solid future. The Honourable Member for Gilmore. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is directed to the Minister for Land Transport. Does the Minister stand by the government's decision not to locate uh, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, AMSAR, in Newcastle, or does he still maintain the statement he made following the government's decision mm. last week, and I quote him, it is outrageous. And I further quote him on the same subject following the government's decision, if AMSAR is to stay in Canberra, it will serve no useful purpose. Does the minister stand by his own statements or by the decision of the government? The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Member should be as aware as anyone else that I have no, further, no continuing responsibility in the area of maritime support. The Honourable Member for Prospect. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I would like to address my question without notice to the Minister for Resources. And I refer the Minister for Resources to an article that appeared in today's Australian. 
newspaper, that article was headed, Tax Low on World Scale. I would like to ask the minister, are the claims made in this particular article accurate? And even if Australian petrol prices are low by world standards, what strategies are available to Australian motorists to cushion the impact of the recent rise in petrol prices brought about by the Gulf crisis? The Honourable Minister. I thank uh, the member for Prospect, Mr Speaker. I did uh, see today's article in The Australian, uh, which has been reflected in other media coverage of these issues. Um, I will go very briefly to uh, my comments uh, earlier this week. That is to uh, simply reinforce the inherent accuracy of the article. That is that Australia's uh, petrol prices are amongst the lowest in the world, that government taxes on petrol are considerably lower than most of the 20 international energy agency countries. Indeed, uh, the most contemporary figures are lower than they in indicated uh, for the June quarter. The most uh, recent indications are that they are running in Australia today at 40 per cent. The latest figures for September, for example, show that while Australian consumers are paying around 74 cents a litre for petrol, uh, Italy $1.62, uh, UK $1.12 and so on. Having said that, I am aware of course about the recent increase in petrol prices in Australia brought about as a result of the Gulf crisis, increasing uh, petrol prices for Australian motorists. Earlier this year I launched, uh, as I think many honourable members will be aware, the 1990 Australian Fuel Consumption Guide. The demand for that uh, particular guide has significantly outstripped its supply. In the past, it has uh, been disseminated to about 400,000 Australians. Uh, this year, it is proposed, uh, because of that increased demand, uh, to have an extra production run. We anticipate, at a minimum, 550,000 uh, booklets to be released. And the key point I want to make here, in uh, relation to the member for Prospect's question, is how driving habits can markedly impact upon fuel consumption. The guide, uh, as I think honourable members have been circulated with, is a very comprehensive document. It goes to uh, the particular fuel, fuel efficiency qualities of a range of uh, motor vehicles on sale in Australia, but more particularly and probably more importantly, it goes to how uh, motorists can significantly reduce both the quantity of fuel that they consume and also, of course, by definition, the amount they pay in after-tax income for their petroleum. And it indicates in the booklet, I uh, hope honourable members will not only read it but disseminate it uh, as much as they can throughout their electorates, that the savings can be of the order of 37 per cent simply by driving uh, a little bit more cautiously. Uh, and that, of course, has spin-off effects not only in uh, overall fuel consumption savings, so it has impacts for our current account and also has very important implications for safety. The Honourable the Acting Leader of the National Party. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Transport and Communications. I refer the Minister to Cabinet's decision to proceed with the third runway at Sydney Airport subject to a satisfactory environmental impact study. I refer the Minister also to a joint press release today from the Member for Grambler, the Member for Kingsford Smith, the Member for Barton, the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services and Senator Faulkner that these Labor MPs have rejected the proposal for a third runway following the release yesterday of the EIS. I ask the Minister to confirm to the House that the third runway at Sydney Airport will proceed provided the EIS is regarded as satisfactory. I also ask the Minister if the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services is bound by Cabinet solidarity. And I finally ask the Minister to assure the House that the period for community consultation on the EIS will not be extended beyond three months. And it's not out of order. The Honourable Minister. Well, it, is, it may not be out of order, but it is misdirected. As it happens, the question of, the, uh, the question of uh, what uh, the, uh, the handling, the public handling of the EIS, of course, is a minister responsibility of the Minister for the Environment, not uh, not for the uh, for the Minister for Transport Order. and the Communication. 
uh, we made quite clear when the, when the EIS was uh, submitted for, uh, for, for analysis, examination, that uh, as far as we're concerned, the third runway would proceed subject to a satisfactory outcome on the EIS. The EIS is now there available for public comment on the question of its satisfactory nature and its implications. All members of parliament on both sides of the House, including this side of the House, are quite entitled to make submissions to that uh, consultative process. And at the end of that period of time, there'll be a response to it. The Honourable Member for Robertson. Uh, Mr Speaker, I direct my question to the Attorney General. What action is the government taking to rid this country of the corporate spivs who have done so much harm to Australia's economy and image? The Honourable the Attorney General. Order. Order. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, member for his question without notice. In relation to the um, the position in uh, respect of uh, corporate crime in this country, I think the member uh, quite obviously is expressing the concern about uh, entirely justified concern about the corporate uh, collapses over the period of uh, particularly the last couple of years, which have not only had a uh, devastating effect uh, uh, domestically but also internationally. And I think that the uh, single most important aspect of that was the fact that we had to have a, uh, a single regulator uh, in the company's area. And uh, quite clearly the cooperative scheme, which operated under the NCSC with the Commonwealth and the States, was not a success. Uh, it was a scheme which was underfunded and in fact uh, was unable to cope uh, with uh, the corporate uh, behaviour referred to by the member. As from the 1st of January next year, Mr Speaker, we will have the Australian Securities Commission as a single corporate regulator and the legislation um, in respect of uh, that body will be coming in uh, to this House uh, in the next uh, few weeks. And uh, in respect of funding for that organisation uh, uh, on the appropriations for the Attorney General's department yesterday, this matter was raised by uh, various members on the other side of the House and uh, in particular the member for Higgins and uh, the funding uh, for the ASC next year will be in the order of $107 million and there are massive uh, increases in funding into the, the area of uh, regulating uh, corporations in this country. And I think, uh, Mr Speaker, it should be said that uh, there have been a, late, a lot of late converts uh, uh, to the Australian Securities Commission, but better to have them on board uh, later rather than, uh, uh, than never. And uh, I think that I look forward to uh, the uh, support uh, of those opposite in relation to the establishment of the Australian Securities Commission, which will, in a very large way, uh, meet the problems referred to by the Honourable Member Robinson. The Honourable the leader of the Acting Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question without notice is to the Acting Prime Minister. I ask the Acting Prime Minister if he agrees with the statement issued last, by, last night by Mr Nobby Clark, Managing Director of the National Australia Bank and Banker of the Year in 1986, that, and I quote, National Australia Savings Bank, National Australia Savings Bank has never been and is not insolvent. If so, will he withdraw the allegations he made yesterday that, and I quote, Nobby's Savings Bank went insolvent in 1986? The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Nobby Clark's got a few problems. One of them isn't needing to be defended by the Acting Leader of the Opposition. Uh, he, he hasn't sunk that low. And uh, while, uh, Mr Speaker, but if we're getting technical, I'm prepared to accept Nobby Clark's assurance that his savings bank in 1986 was not technically insolvent. But he must accept my claim that had the government not introduced a $120 million subsidy and deregulated the rate on all future loans, that his savings bank book would have needed to be liquidated as it was unviable. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, Nobby Clark and I are old sparring partners and as, as the public uh, record will attest, uh, he, often, uh, he often sends a barb my way. And he knows that uh, full well I'd never let him off the hook when he trips up. 
and you expect nothing less, I'm sure. And while uh, Nobby Clark does run an effective bank, Order. he did trip up in 1986, and this was well known in the industry. In 1986, Mr Clark created problems for himself and his savings bank because of a deliberate management strategy of his, and that is what I was talking about yesterday. It wasn't, a, wasn't about the technical issue of solvency, but the fact that... <laughs> but the fact that... Order. Uh, uh, but, Order. But, but, but the fact is, he had he had an Order. unviable bank book, which Order. He, had, he had an un. Order. He had the he, member for Benelong. He, he had an unviable. He had an unviable. Order. He had an unviable savings bank book, which was in need of liquidation, and would have had to have been liquid liquidation had had he not. Had he cost, and let me Order. say, it, Mr. Speaker, Order. Mr. Speaker, he deliberately boosted lending for housing in 1984-5 in an aggressive bid for market share, and this was while the 13.5% ceiling was firmly in place. And he funded this expansion lending with high cost term deposits. The leader of the opposition. He was therefore increasing the risk associated with his savings bank in a major way. His liabilities were becoming more exposed to market interest rates, and all his liabilities were at a floating rate, and his assets had a fixed ceiling. By early 1986, the flaw in Mr Clark's strategy was fully exposed. His term deposits were costing him 15 to 15.5 per cent, while his housing loan assets were earning 13.5. Obviously, he's saying, no, yours. You put the ceiling on, brother. Remember for you put the ceiling on. You're the old regulator. You left the ceiling on. Order. The member for Mr. Benelong Speaker, will cease to check. Obviously, his savings bank was losing money. Benelong. Appoint Mr. Clark been now. The all afternoon. Mr. Speaker, obviously, his savings bank was losing money. Appoint he now concedes himself. The inescapable conclusion is that without the government's subsidy of $120 million announced on the 2nd of April 1986, and which NAB's share was $22 million, Mr. Clark's savings bank was not viable, and he would have had to have had would have needed to liquidate his savings bank book. All the banks had problems with housing lending during early 1986, but with the deregulation of new loans for housing on the 2nd of April 1986, the major banks would have continued with housing lending. NAB's problems were much greater and were due to the earlier lending strategy of 1984-85. As I have said, this was well known in the industry at the time. It was only, it was only for the government's housing assistance package involving the subsidy to the savings banks announced on the 2nd of April, which enabled NAB's savings bank to continue to expand and enable all the savings bank to rapidly take advantage of the deregulation of new housing lending while protecting existing mortgage holders. The fact is, Mr Speaker, if Mr Clark wants to make points about people tripping up, he can't make it when, in fact, he exposed his own institution to this strategic mistake for which he was only rescued by the Commonwealth Government. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Aged, Family and Health Services. And I ask the Minister, with the government's reform of the aged care program currently in its advanced stages, what is the Minister doing to ensure that these changes and reforms will be extended to those older and disabled people in our community not living in residential care? The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I'd like to uh, thank the member for Morton for his question and uh, in doing so recognise the, the role that he's playing in his own electorate in uh, looking after people who are frail, aged and disabled. I've had the opportunity to be there on a number of occasions. But this is a uh, very important week for those people, the frail, aged and younger disabled people in our community who uh, use a lot of uh, government services such as the Home and Community Care Program and the Nursing Homes and Hostels of Australia. We have seen the, uh, the uh, release of a charter of rights and responsibilities for the residents of nursing homes and hostels, and today I had the uh, great pleasure of launching a statement of rights and responsibilities for the Home and Community Care Program the, the people the member for Morton is referring to. And that will uh, enable the functionally disabled of, of any age to remain in their homes rather than suffer premature entry to institutions, and at the same time give uh, them an understanding, give the community, the people who serve them, the community generally, 
a, uh, a far better idea of what uh, it means to be in that situation, but also to uh, give them uh, access to basic rights and have those rights and responsibilities respected. The Home Community Care Program is, a, is an innovation in this government, as uh, you only know too well, Mr Speaker. Your report of in a home or at home was a, a landmark report, uh, along with the work that you did and the work that uh, many people on both sides of this House did to uh, give government the direction of reform of, of aged care and disabled services in this country. The, uh, this government's commitment to that, that program obviously can't be doubted. Expenditures have more than uh, trebled since the introduction to an estimated $285 million, $282 million this year. And, but what more than dollars, what we've seen is a, a tremendous expansion in the range of services that are now available in the community. The number of services has actually about doubled since 1984-85. And the range of those services also expanded greatly. There are now 369 daycare centres operating in this country. Put that in terms of, uh, into, another, into another context, that means that at the rate of about two a week, daycare centres for the frail aged and disabled have been opening in this country. I don't think that's uh, something that most people would certainly not be aware of. Among that, there are about 47 uh, centres which cater specifically for dementia sufferers and about 180 uh, non-centre-based respite uh, services for people as well. And there are about 220 hack services that cater specifically for people from non-English speaking backgrounds, including Aborigines. And no one knows better uh, about the difference between a good service and an unsuitable one than the person who has to use that service. And the uh, hack statement of rights and responsibilities has uh, really quite tremendous significance for the 300,000 elderly and, and younger people who use uh, these services every month, as well as their carers. The statement outlines the uh, rights and responsibilities of, of consumers and their dealings with the service providers. And of course, the state and territory governments have cooperated greatly with the government in the service and in the statement. Now, what, what I think is important, Mr. and the other, the, the, those on the other side are getting restless. Order. Perhaps I could uh, basically settle them down a little bit. What I was going to say, what I was going to say, was that uh, that there is, there should be in this country some respect for the way in which both sides of this house have contributed towards the reforms, through your committee and through the work in this house, that uh, we have seen uh, many changes occurring in the aged care reform program, particularly to cater with the needs of our ageing population. People now have choices. They have choices in home community care, in hostels, in nursing homes, things like multi-purpose centres for those uh, more rural and remote areas. This has been a very significant area of, of social reform as well as microeconomic reform. It's an area of microeconomic reform, in fact, in making sure that the dollars, that are, that, uh, the, the billions of dollars that go through these programs hit the ground, getting the best value for the dollar. And what these statements will do in the Home Community Care Program as well as the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities for Residents of Nursing Homes and Hostels will make sure that they are quality dollars that hit the ground as well. The Honourable Member for Benelong. Uh, Mr yeah. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer and I remind the Treasurer of his mammoth uh, press conference following the caucus decision to endorse uh, the acquisition of the State Savings Bank of Victoria and a partial privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank. And in the course of uh, that press conference, the Treasurer said, and I quote, the first thing I said, and that was in response to the approach by the Victorians, was that my interest in this was for the stability of the financial system, and that had to be guaranteed above everything else. I asked the Treasurer why did he abandon that impeccably stated standard yesterday. Yeah. Well, the Honourable the, the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I didn't. I didn't. In fact... In fact, what I was reminding you yesterday, in 1986, I was doing just that again. I was doing, in 1986, for Mr Clark, what I was doing for the State Savings Bank of Victoria in 1990. So we're going to get Brother. That's what I was doing. And uh, having needed to have done it, I didn't then take too kindly to Mr Clark's view that preening himself as, uh, as you put it, banker of the year and 
touting the fact that he's got the highest earnings per employee, etc., etc., and all the other measures of banking, that from his uh, pedestal uh, he should be uh, attacking the management of economic policy, where in fact he had left his bank exposed to the position where his book wasn't viable. And I just made that point about a condition four years ago. Now that's got nothing to do with the contemporary banking system. And need I say, had I not uh, secured the government support to introduce a subsidy and deregulate housing rates for the future, we would have had a lot less housing lending in the last four years, because housing lending was then coming back down towards the 105,000 starts where this government found it in 1983, and it then shot back up and, of course, reached 180 odd thousand from memory starts last year. Uh, we would not have had that condition without the deregulation of housing. Now, in the face of foreign bank entry and getting positioned in the market, Mr Clark and his bank made a strategic decision to lend aggressively for housing but financed on these uh, trading bank type uh, 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 instruments. And then, as monetary conditions tightened, they had to finance their book with fixed rate mortgages at rates of interest higher than the prevailing lending rate, which made the strategy, of course, and the book unviable. Now, I just make that point. It's got nothing to do, my remarks yesterday got nothing to do, nothing whatsoever to do with the uh, viability of the financial system as a whole, but, they had, but my actions had much to do with it then. And I only say this to the former Treasurer, that uh, uh, had he uh, been able to free up housing when Treasurer, perhaps this position wouldn't have arisen. But it did arise. And, no, 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 no. I should have realised that yesterday. No, but I mean, you're always telling us. No, I know. But you're always round looking. Order. No, no, but you're always touting around looking for a deregulatory badge of honour. And I've given you a few, actually, but I can't give you one on housing. And I had to do it. And it got done. And it saved Nobby's skin. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Karaya. Um, Mr Speaker, my question without notice is to the Minister for Primary Industry and, Ener and Resources. The, the Minister will be aware that until recently carpet walls were sold through a private network and were successfully marketed and, and totally sold. He will also be aware that that section of the wool industry was the only section where there was total value added within Australia. Is the minister able to explain why, since the Wool Corporation decided to intervene in this marketplace, carpet walls are now being stockpiled, carpet manufacturers are forced, because of the excessive price through the Wool Corporation, to import wools into Australia? and the processors who added value to that industry are now closing down. The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable uh, Member for his question, and um, he takes a close interest in the carpet wool factory, particularly in his electorate. And what he does point to is, is quite a problem. Uh, if we could just uh, address one part of his question, is that, and that is the fact that the Carpet wool growers are seeking an exemption right now from all or part of the wool tax, and that's required by legislation to be paid on all shorn wool, including medulated and other coarse wool suitable for carpet manufacturers. And the carpet wool growers have made representations seeking exemption from the price support component of the wool tax because they believe the current 18 per cent tax particularly affects them. Now, carpet wools are bought by the carpet manufacturers, scoured and blended, rather than greasy form. And carpet wool growers have established their own cooperatives, undertake these processes, and prepare their wool for the Australian market. And they support these co-ops through a 6 per cent voluntary levy. So they're currently paying 24 per cent in taxes and levies on wool of about $2.50 or $3 a kilo value. And 90 per cent of the, the carpet wool used in Australia is imported. So, as the member points out, Australian grown carpet wool is import replacing. Now, the Wool Council passed a resolution at Roma in uh, May of this year that the Wool Corporation investigate tax exemption for carpet wool. And both the Car Wool Council and the Wool Corporation have now advised me that they don't support exemption of carpet wool 
on the grounds that exemptions result in inequities at the margin. Uh, that is why should you uh, give any particular treatment to one grade of wool. It's an inappropriate to distinguish wools and on grounds of end use, and uh, any exemption would create an undesirable precedent. Now, this issue is complex and obviously has implications for wool marketing arrangements in general, and I've spent uh, five hours in the conference this morning addressing uh, those arrangements. I can tell the member I am giving close consideration to the cases put forward by the Carpet Wool Growers and the Wool Council and Corporation and anticipate being in a position to make um, some decisions over the next month or so. In terms of the Wool Corporation's own activities in um, scouring wool to, uh, to store this coarse wool and in terms of their general approach to the carpet industry, that is something also that I'm having discussions with them about. Uh, I believe there is a case to say that um, the carpet wool industry uh, should be off to one side uh, of this industry, and again, that is something that I'm looking at. The Honourable the Acting Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question without notice is to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer the Acting Prime Minister to his answer uh, to my last question and his failure to confirm his statement of yesterday that in 1986 the National Australia Bank was insolvent. I ask the Acting Prime Minister if he now admits he misled the Parliament yesterday, and will he give a formal and fulsome apology to Mr Clark? Yes. Yes. The Honourable the Acting Speaker, Prime Minister. I doubt Mr Clark would think that the Acting Leader of the Opposition would be doing him any favour beating this particular drum. I mean, I regard Mr Clark as one of the most competent people in Australian finance, and the fact that he slipped, <laughs> the fact, the fact that he slipped up. The fact that he slipped up Order. in 1986 only makes him, only makes him fallible. Only makes him fallible. But I doubt, Order. I doubt in a sort of a head-to-head -head contest, he uh, would not regard my colleague opposite as even competition, and I would heartily concur. So don't bother defending Nobby's interest. He can do them quite well himself. He's on the radio most days at it. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, look. Let me repeat what I said. If we're getting technical, I'm prepared to accept Mr Clark's assurance that his savings bank was not technically insolvent, but he must accept my claim that his Order. book needed, was, was in, 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 unviable and was in need of liquidation. Order. Now there. Simple as that. Uh, Order. The honourable member for Cornwall. I have called the honourable member for Cornwall. Mr. Speaker, I respected uh, your call. But you will, you will have me again. The honourable member for Cornwall. Mr. Speaker, I desire to ask a question of the honourable minister for communications. The minister will have been briefed on the financial problems of the Channel 10 television network. Order. The member for Higgins and of much speculation in relation to the future of the television industry, which has arisen as a result. And I ask, firstly, will the government support the watering down of television standards and Australian content requirements, as has been requested by some media executives? And secondly, will the government act to ensure the continuation of the third television network within approved standards? The Honourable Minister. Uh, the government's policy uh, has been uh, clear-cut as far as uh, the issue of uh, uh, ownership and uh, numbers of services to be provided in each, uh, in each region. And last week, uh, that position was reiterated. We support the provision of three commercial services in each region. We support that uh, those commercial services operating with comprehensive uh, services. Uh, we, of course, support the uh, the standards laid down by the ABT on uh, content and uh, uh, other related issues, uh, and we support the ownership provisions which ensure that there is only one owner uh, in each particular region with, of course, uh, a capacity to own uh, services across regions. Uh, the government's uh, policy has been that for some considerable period of time. Uh, policy remains that, and uh, the government continually advises the industry of that fact. Uh, it is obvious that there are a number of the stations having substantial, severe financial problems at this time. Those 
position, that position is a result of investment decisions made by those stations within the framework of the regulatory opportunities that the government provides. It's not the government's responsibility to micromanage the way in which uh, the uh, management of those particular stations and their owners conduct their financial affairs. It is the government's responsibility to make statements about what, uh, what policy is and to introduce legislation to ensure that policy is upheld. Uh, and that we have done and will continue to do. The Acting Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on notice paper. So before I call the Leader of the Opposition, I'll call the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to uh, seek your indulgence to add to an answer I gave earlier. The Minister may add to the answer. I wish to provide a further answer in relation to a question without notice asked of me by the Honourable Member for O'Connor on the 21st of, De 21st of December 1989. The Honourable Member asked a question relating to the administration of the higher education administration charge in which he alleged that my wife had received preferential treatment in receiving a refund of HEAC following her withdrawal from a course at Murdoch University. He specifically asked what, influenced, what influence did I exert to bring about this alleged preferential treatment. I have now received a copy of a letter from Murdoch University which unequivocally exonerates myself and my wife of the impropriety inferred by the Honourable Member. The letter makes it clear, firstly, that my wife would have incurred a HEAC liability only if she had failed to withdraw from the course before the 31st of March. The relevant university authorities became aware on or about the 4th of March of my wife's intention not to finalise her enrolment. Thirdly, for administrative convenience, the university authorities backdated the date of effect to the 21st of February. This backdating had no impact at all on my wife's status at the university or on her fees liability and that I had no influence on this matter. The university's letter makes the point that the material on this matter came into the possession of the honourable member and was misinterpreted and that in particular my wife's non-liability to pay the HEAC was ignored. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to table the letter. Now that the member for O'Connor is completely in possession of the facts on this matter, and is also aware of the anguish that allegations made under privilege can cause to individually, individuals and their families, he might feel inclined to apologise to my wife. Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Acting Leader of the Opposition moving forth with the following motion. Namely, I move that this House censures the Acting Prime Minister and Treasurer for misleading the House and abusing the privileges of his office. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Are you going to is, take it? Is there a second of the proposal? Sure. The motion is seconded. The question is that the, the standing orders be suspended. All those of that opinion, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that this House censures the Acting Prime Minister and Treasurer for misleading the House and abusing the privileges of his office. Mr Speaker, a censure motion is a grave charge that can be levelled against a and one of the most grave charges that can be levelled against a minister in the Parliament. It is not a motion that we move lightly. We do so because we believe that the Acting Prime Minister has abused the privileges of his high office and misled the House. And, uh, to, put the, to put the facts very simply, yesterday, in response to some pretty standard criticisms of his economic policy, the Treasurer chose to use information supplied to him in his capacity as Treasurer, responsible for the supervision of the banking system, to score a cheap political point. And in this process, he has shown no judgment a reckless disregard for the reputation of our banking system and, for good measure, he was just plain wrong and misled the House. And I must say his response today was simply not good enough. Right. I mean, it was yesterday in this parliament at question time that he, in a deliberate and premeditated attack on the National Australia Bank and Mr Clark, declared that, and I quote, in 1986, the bank was technically insolvent. A black and white allegation, assertion from a person who has access to information upon which such a statement might reasonably be expected by the public to be relied upon. And it is not good enough for him to come into this House today and give us a completely different response and to claim that it was technically insolvent. 
And the basis of his defence today were events going back into 1986. I mean, yesterday he claimed that he rescued a savings bank as a result of the actions of that bank and the extent of its loan book in respect of housing. But if you go back to 1986, where were the statements? Where were the statements by this Treasurer that would substantiate his claim of yesterday and his defence of today? Well, in fact, they do not exist. And go to his statement, for example, he referred to it uh, in question time today of the 2nd of April 1986, and go to the first paragraph when, that's, uh, when, that, uh, when the Treasurer announced the package for the change uh, in the ceiling or the lifting of the ceiling for new home loans, and you find the reason for the introduction of that package at that time. He said, the government has today decided on a number of actions to ensure that sufficient bank home loan funds will be available to borrowers so that activity and employment in the housing industry will be maintained at a satisfactory level. And why did he do a deal with the banks to provide them with a subsidy in respect of those home loan owners who are going to have the benefit of the ceiling for one simple reason, nothing to do with the solvency or the viability of the banks at all, but for the simple political reason that he was not prepared to cop the political consequences of his own actions. And the fact is that you had run a cheap political scare campaign on that very issue against the opposition, and you had no political choice but to do what you did. And your, your, your excuse today is nothing but a hollow and empty excuse, easily refuted by the evidence of 1986. And I look forward to the contribution by my second uh, the member for Benelong, who will ram home that point. Now, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me uh, say to the Treasurer that the least he could do in his response today is to get up and to admit that he was wrong and to apologise and to retract his statements. And it will be a mark of this man who aspires for the key to the lodge. It will be a mark of this man. You've had a bad week. Maybe you could finish it on an up by having the decency, just the basic common decency, to admit that you are wrong. And whilst you're at it, you want to admit that you've been wrong in your economic policy. And, uh, you know, Mr. Mr Speaker, you really need to look at that outburst yesterday in a broader political and economic context. I mean, it just didn't happen overnight uh, in a vacuum. The fact is that his economic policies have failed. This is a failed treasurer. Not the world's greatest treasurer, but in fact Australia's failed treasurer. And the country is teetering on an economic recession. A recession, Mr Treasurer, that you have induced. Your budget, an absolute failure. You lost the, the centrepiece, the microeconomic reform that you've been brawling about for weeks and weeks and months uh, in, in recent times. You turned up on budget night in a lacklustre performance, if ever I've seen one. Why? Because you'd lost your, your centrepiece. You'd lost your centrepiece. Uh, and the truth is that your substitute centrepiece was to claim fiscal responsibility. And that sunk without a trace. Uh, one that we had the pleasure of a couple of torpedoes into that proposition on the night. And Senator Walsh, Senator Walsh finished you off within 48 hours. And you know, <laughs> you know, Treasurer, I mean, you might have you might have escaped with some credibility if on the Tuesday night you'd had the honesty to say, as you said on the following Friday, that this country is on the road to our Argentina. I mean, the reason that your budget sank without trace is because it simply did not tell the truth. Now, Mr Speaker, we have a failed Treasurer, we have a, an economy in recession, and we find, not from the Treasurer, just a simple admission that it's time for some changes, a, a simple admission that his policies have been wrong. What do we find in its place? Nothing but a counter-attack based on personal abuse and distortion of the truth. And you look at recent events. I mean, the only, the only lever this, let me say, the only lever that uh, he's keen on pulling levers, our Treasurer, and I envisage him in front of a row of levers, say 12, and on each and every one of those levers there's a little sign that says, out, out of order, by order of Bill Kelty, and one lever left the lever of high interest rates. 
And that high interest rate policy, the one-dimensional high interest rate policy, <coughs> has placed a lot of pressure on our acting, our practising Prime Minister. And it is true that decent customers have been burnt by high interest rates in recent months, many of them. Young home owners, own, owners unable to get a home. And young people, and not so young people, trying to run a business. They've been burnt and they've been going into bankruptcy in their record numbers. It's true they've been burnt, but who lit the fire that burnt them? None other than the Treasurer himself. Who threw the match, the lit match, uh, into the can of petrol? None other than the Treasurer himself. And it's true, it is true. Unemployment is rising. In fact, it's now beyond your own budget prediction of just a few short weeks ago. The reason being that you have deliberately induced a recession. I mean, he is the boom and bust merchant of Australian economic management. The fact is uh, his policies have failed and instead of doing the right thing and simply accepting the responsibility of his own actions, he lashes out at whoever comes near him. He attacked the Reserve Bank. What, what was their crime for pointing out that you'd have high interest rates whilst ever you had high inflation? He attacked his own colleague, number three. When number two gets into number three, you know you've got problems. He attacked Senator Button. What was his crime? Simply pointing out that how can you look towards a major restructuring of the Australian, Australian industry when you've got a treasurer running a macroeconomic policy that is directly contrary to the government's microeconomic reform objectives. And the Business Council of Australia, well, they are attacked for pointing out that, look, regardless of how important the decisions might be on telecommunications and the sale of the airlines, and they are important, but it is nonsense to suggest that they are the be-all and end-all of economic management, as I am sure you will be telling us on Monday night and Tuesday morning. The truth is there is a lot to be done in terms of economic management, in terms of the changes we need in economic policy if we are to turn this country, uh, turn this country around. Uh, Mr Speaker, despite the intensity of some of these personal attacks, there is no doubt that the daddy of them all has been the acting Prime Minister's attack, his vitriolic attacks on the banks. And it's a standard attack for cornered cowards of the Labor movement to lash out at the banks. It's a campaign laced with envy and reminiscent of many campaigns from Labor campaigners of the past. Your old mentor, Jack Lang, he was pretty keen on getting stuck into the banks. And some of those Labor governments of the post-war years, they were hell-bent on nationalising them. And all of this intertwined with none, nothing more important than our practising Prime Minister's prime ministerial ambitions. And don't forget, I mean, this is the man who said not so long ago, it has been ingrained in me from childhood to think that my mission in life is to run you. And uh, if Bob Hawke thinks that he's, he's merely the Treasurer, none other but the Treasurer himself, and uh, as uh, the Prime Minister sits out a, a typhoon holding him up in Tokyo, he ought to remember there's a message in all of this for him too. He ought to remember the words quoted to him by the Treasurer in 1980 who said, the first Labor leader I tear down will be the one I replace. So, Mr Speaker, we have a background of failed economic policy, dwindling prospects for the Treasurer of entering the lodge as he's got uh, the Minister for Telecommunications and Aviation breathings down his neck and a counter-attack from the Treasurer which revolves around personal abuse. And can I just say, uh, take the opportunity to say that his other favourite tactic is to avoid telling the truth. And I'm glad uh, the new member for Robertson uh, is here because I think he would accept what I say. I mean, uh, Treasurer, you hoodwink your own people and they're fools enough, most of them, to believe you. I mean, for years you've said that wages had to be reduced so that profits could go up, so that we could have investments. You know, the old J-curve, five years old, the J-curve this year. The truth, profits after interest have actually gone down. I mean, here we have a lot of pain, no gain, Mr Treasurer. For years you've talked about what a great cutter you are, you know, how good you've been at cutting. Uh, government expenditure. Look at the figures. Look at the truth of it. Let's see your answer when you stand, Treasurer. Uh, let's look at the figures. The truth is we are spending as much now as a Commonwealth government as a percentage of the national cake as when you first came into office. And you, had the, you had the audacity the other day to claim that spending would be back to the levels of the 1950s. Simply not true. You ought to stand up and deliver your response today. And your daddy of them all, your claim of recent months that there was a crisis in the state bank and that you knew nothing about it until the 19th of June 1990. 
Well, I don't know what you knew, I don't know when you knew it, but I do know that you knew a lot more than what you've been letting on. You ran that deal through down the throats of your Labor colleagues, the colleagues of your own party. And I'll say to you, I mean, if you get something 30 per cent right, you get a 30 per cent credit from us. But don't stoop to deceit and bully your own colleagues. The fact is you've been too smart by half, and your colleagues know it, many of them do, and the, the smug inner smile on, your, on the face of your colleague over there is just the evidence of the truth of what I'm saying. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, yesterday the acting leader of the National Party asked the Treasurer to comment on the remarks of two leading businessmen who had been critical of, of the Treasurer's economic policy. One was the President of the Business Council of Australia, or the President-elect, and the other was Mr Nobby Clark, Banker of the Year in 1986 and Chief Executive of the National Australia Bank, one of Australia's biggest financial institutions. Mr Clark's words uh, were colourful, but they were to the point, and he said, let me remind you, if I had the strike rate of my friend in Canberra and the economy in tatters, then I'd be out selling pencils and shoelaces in Collins Street. Not a vitriolic attack. I mean, it's not a personal attack. I mean, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are the holder of high office, and you know, I mean, if you think those comments of Mr. Clark's were exceptional, it just shows you how out of touch you are. I mean, the rest of the country, by and large, would agree with Mr. Clark. I mean, I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't say anything that was news. For heaven's sakes, you ought to go door knocking. You ought, to, you ought to take the Prime Minister's advice, get into a few supermarkets. And you'll find, look, at the, look at the expressions on the people in the gallery. I mean, he made those remarks last weekend. They were widely reported. Now, it's no surprise to anybody, and I'm sure it was no surprise to the Treasurer, that during this week the opposition would bowl that question up to him. And he was there ready and waiting, right. waiting, waiting to exploit to the maximum the exposure available to him at question time to launch his premeditated attack on Mr Clark and the bank. And in response to the question, the acting Prime Minister set out deliberately to undermine the bank. He said, let me quote, Nobby's savings bank went insolvent in 1986. He said that again in 1989 the trading banks, including the National Australia Bank, were under, and I quote, a very great stress. And he said, in 1986, the bank was technically insolvent and was rescued by the Commonwealth of Australia. That is the fact of the matter. Mr Speaker, those are not the facts of the matter. And the acting Prime Minister cannot try to fudge the issue by any measure, by any measure of talking about viability or profitability in substitute for the concept of insolvency. And I say to you, Mr Treasurer, if you attempt to do so, then you are a Treasurer who does not understand the simple concept of insolvency. And what a remarkable, what a remarkable fact that would be, given the level of insolvency and bankruptcies brought about by this Treasurer's policy. It's true. It is true that, as Mr Clark says in his annual report, that uh, the savings bank outcome for that year was not as good as the bank would have liked. But it still made a profit of about $30 million, even, even taking into account the $7 million worth of subsidy, well in excess of that $7 million subsidy. And the fact is that you know, the truth is that the banks had to tackle your ever higher interest rates and continue to fund housing loans at a lower and fixed rate. And the alternative? The alternative was to cut back, to cut back their housing lending. Is that really what the Treasurer is saying? Of course not. How can he say it when the record is so clear, uh, that statement which I read earlier? So, Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, the definition of insolvency is the inability to pay debts when they arise. At no stage, at no stage whatsoever, has the National Australia Savings Bank been insolvent. The auditors, the auditors' report is publicly available, and the directors specifically reported that, and I quote, as at the date of this statement, there are reasonable grounds to believe that the company will be able to pay its debts as and when they fall due. And Mr Clark, in a statement last night and repeated on AM, categorically denied the Treasurer's claim. He said, and I quote for the record, National Australia Savings Bank has never been and is not insolvent. But the acting Prime Minister hasn't just been contradicted by the National Australia Bank or by the auditors. The Australian Financial Review reported this morning that, and I quote, 
The Reserve Bank had no formal comment on the Treasurer's allegations, but senior officials suggest that neither the National nor any other bank has been in breach of the prudential requirements of the Reserve or has become insolvent. And lastly, let me draw the House's attention to the Treasurer's own statements at his press conference on the 28th of August 1990 when he said, I mean the reason why we don't have any federally supervised banks in difficulties is because every major entry in a bank's book is looked at against the balance and makeup of its book and that is a weekly process. And he went on to say in another quote that no federally supervised bank has got any difficulties. To be insolvent would, not be, would be to be uh, in difficulty by any fair definition. So the Treasurer ought to, in his defence today, state whether his statement on the 29th of August was untrue or whether his statement yesterday was untrue. You can't have it both ways, Mr Treasurer. Mr Speaker, this is an absolutely open and shut case. It is beyond reasonable doubt that the acting Prime Minister misled the House and he deserves the House's censure accordingly. And I say, Mr Speaker, in respect of the second aspect in respect of the discharge of the duties of his high office. The fact is that if you accept that, as he effectively said today, the acting Prime Minister has never had any information to substantiate his claim, then it is very clear that the claim, the allegations that he made yesterday, are allegations entirely without foundation. His attack, therefore, was launched for his own base political purposes. He recklessly disregarded. He completely put to one side his obligations as the ultimate supervisor of our banking system. He entirely put to one side his obligations for the overall prudential supervision of the banking system. I know he treated Victoria as if it were on the moon uh, until it suited him to push through his partial privatisation proposals. And on Pyramid, I know that he says uh, that it's a state responsibility, although in his own words you know, he knew of events as they unfolded. And of course there was a run on the bank. I mean, how, how is it, Mr Treasurer, that you could be so oblivious, seemingly oblivious, to the financial difficulties and the erosion of public confidence in our financial institutions of recent times so as to allow you to make your, un your premeditated effect? You ought to have been aware. Uh, of those events of recent times and that your actions had the potential to lead to an erosion of public confidence in our financial institutions. And the information that you receive as Treasurer is not given to you lightly, not given to you for political purpose. In fact, if you read the Banking Act and the Reserve Bank Act and other legislative constraints upon you, Treasurer, isn't it clear that you have a responsibility to ensure the confidentiality of information because confidentiality is an absolutely essential element of any effective system of prudential supervision? Mr Speaker, I believe this is, as I said, a black and white, a clear and open shut case. The fact is that Virtually, on his own words today, the Treasurer misled the House yesterday, and virtually, on his own words and in his own admission as a result, he used his high office for the most base political purposes to score nothing but a cheap political point. Is, is the motion seconded? Is the motion seconded? The Honourable Member for Bennelong. The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what we've the question is that the motion be agreed to. Speaker, the Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. Another speech from the doyen of the Frankston Police Court, delivered with the uh, delivered with the usual delivered with the usual lack of style, wit, or content. Without, without, the, without any style, wit, or content. A predetermined strategy. You came in here today. You decided you were going to have this motion after question time. Uh, without fa failing to register what I said in the course of question time about accepting Mr Clark's assurance about solvency, failing to register that, you still went on because once programmed you're too dull to change your tactics. Uh, and uh, ha Had I believed uh, you under would have understood what unviable meant, perhaps I would have used the word unviable instead of insolvent. But it's because I thought that you people, you people over there, are such dummies Order. that you wouldn't know the difference. Well, you wouldn't know what unviable meant, so I didn't use it. Order. 
But, uh, Mr. Speaker, a member from uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, without uh, uh, the, uh, the acting leader of the opposition said that what I had to say is without any foundation in fact. My reference is the National Australia Bank and its book in 1986 without any foundation in fact. And he said uh, that uh, it was uh, confidential information. Well, because I regard this as basically uh, uh, a, uh, an occasional spat I have with Mr Clark, I'm not about to indeed do that, to release confidential information about the National Australia Bank or Mr Clark or information Mr Clark has given me, though of course I have plenty. Uh, but I won't be into that business. So don't, don't, uh, don't fear. Uh, on that point about confidential information, what I said yesterday was well known to the whole banking industry. It wasn't confidential information, but I have plenty of that, I can assure you. Now, Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, well, it means a lot, but you don't know precisely what it means. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, and uh, the other claim that was made, Mr. the other claim uh, was made, uh, Mr Speaker, was that the banking package, pack, package I introduced in 1986 was made for political reasons which had nothing to do with the banks. It was done for base political reasons with the, the subsidy. That's what he said, for base political reasons, and including, of course, the deregulation of future rates of housing. Nothing to do with the banks. The banks are at the point where they could not continue to lend for housing. They could not continue to lend for housing. And if I had not deregulated the future rate, people wouldn't have had housing loans for a number of years. So the idea that was done as a political, for political reasons uh, is uh, uh, very strange indeed, where in fact we had housing stars starting to plummet towards the 100,000 level from about 145 or 50,000 in the previous year. We had a dramatic close down of the, of the housing industry and that's why the package was introduced. But the acting leader of the opposition says it was done for political reasons because he can never recognise a real fact or a real policy when he sees one. And then after that, he got off the whole issue of banking because he didn't have much more to say than two or three minutes worth about that and about Mr Clark and his book. And then he got on to uh, the question of personal abuse. And if he doesn't think that Mr Clark saying of the Treasurer and the stewardship of economic policy that I should be in Collins Street selling shoelaces and pencils and that's not economic abu uh, uh, personal abuse, then I don't know what is. And so it's pretty, disin it's pretty disingenuous for you to get up saying that's not Dundas. political abuse uh, when obviously it is. The fact is I've had plenty of it from Mr Clark and I've given him a bit back and no doubt I'll give him more as time goes by. Now, uh, Mr Speaker, um, um, now he said he then, the Deputy Leader then went on to say that we'd burn people with higher interest rates. But it was the Leader of the Opposition all through 1989 saying the government had not acted to lift interest rates high enough. It was all through 1989 that you were saying we had politically subverted the central bank. It was all through 1989 you were saying that the Leader of the Opposition was saying that we need an independent central bank to get a monetary policy the country needed, i.e. higher rates. And now, with all the hypocrisy you can muster, you're now saying that we're burning people as the economy sinks into a recession, as you put it, uh, in terms of slower activity. The truth is you don't have any rhyme or reason as a policy. You don't have any structure as a policy. You've been arguing for higher interest rates all through 1988 and 89 all the time, and now you're saying we're burning people with them. I mean, what, what hypocrisy? But this is the fact. I mean, you get up and you think a slick speech which lacks content or integrity passes for some kind of rebuke to the government, and yet you have not the slightest policy structure whatsoever. Then you said the attack on banks was the cornered cowards from the cornered cowards of the Labor Party. Well, we've noticed your refusal as a party or your condonement of the bank's margins in this latest monetary episode. We've noticed your silence, and not just your silence, your support for the bank's soaking people, small and medium business people, who the Liberal Party of Australia and the National Party of Australia support having been soaked by the banks of this country. We've noticed you. No, no. No, we've, we have done, we have done more for the banking industry in terms of structure than any government in the history of the Federation. 
but we won't see ordinary business people or persons ripped off by high margins without complaint. That's your position. That's your, that is your position. Then you went on to say, so you've, you've denied your leader's views about monetary policy by referring to the, bur the burning them. You're condoning them high margins of banks. Then you go on to say that I have told untruths about the profit levels in this country, profits to GDP, which is of course absurd. You just pick up the statistician's release. Then you went on to say, you said on cutting government exp on cutting government expenditure, on cutting government expenditure. Well, if you'd have asked a question, I would have given you a reply. But you've had all week, and you couldn't muster one. You've been, you, you, you only you only asked the questions which are put into your hand, Mr. Speaker. Then he talks about cutting government expenditure. He says spending now. Listen to this. Spending now as a proportion of the national cake was the same when they came to office. That's right. And the same when they came to office. It's down by 7 per cent of gross domestic product. It's down by nearly $30 billion a year, from 30.5 per cent of GDP to 23.4. And yet we've got the deputy leader, the shadow treasurer, saying that I have told untruths and the spending is now down as a percentage of, uh, of, uh, of national spending. Uh, it is where it was when we came to office, which of course is an absurdity and denies seven years of painstaking effort by the government in cutting back your profligacy. And then the crisis in the state bank. You say, I, I've, I'm supposed to know a lot more than I'm letting on. This is this smear campaign you're running, which you were routed with a week or so ago at question time, that in some, that in some, some respects I uh, knew and engineered some crisis in the State Bank of Victoria. And then we had, of course, the absurd position by your leader that it was a Victorian problem which should have a Victorian solution, as if the Victorian government could deal with a, a run on a bank with $25 billion worth of deposits. I mean, this is the sort of nonsense we hear from you. And uh, because uh, you think uh, uh, you can make a point on Mr Clark's behalf, you're up here trying to, uh, make, a, uh, trying to make a poor political point. I noticed that uh, one of our journalists had this to say in the bulletin this week. He said, uh, having watched the way Parliament has operated in recent weeks, I have a suggestion for more fundamental reform. It seems to me it would be a good idea to have a group of MPs designated the opposition, whose role would be to ask probing questions, expose the government's shortcomings and attack where it makes mistakes. Hawke, however, might find it difficult to get Hewson's agreement for such a change. Now, now, the fact is, there's people mocking your performance in Parliament. You've got no... Look, you say you made a point about the profit share. You said, I've, I've made this point, you haven't responded to me. You threw it out in the press statement. Of course, it is totally wrong, totally wrong, well, lacking in any structure. You've, you've, had all week to add, you've had all week to ask a question about the it. The Leader of the I've Opposition will cease to check. I've a response here for you, and you had nothing to say about it. Nothing to say about it whatsoever, because you're incapable of putting a bit of, uh, a bit of material together yourself. It isn't handed, put in your hand by some staff person. That's the long and short of it. But, Mr Speaker, this, uh, this whole strategy is one which was uh, determined overnight by the opposition, and they have not moved off it, not moved off it, and decided to move this uh, so-called censure motion, despite the fact uh, that uh, I, I registered my view about Mr Clark's statements overnight. And uh, what we have here is basically the opposition uh, trying to uh, basically fill in time and waste points. Why, why, uh, fill in, make points and waste time. I noticed that uh, we heard yesterday from the member for Ben Long. He was fulminating and fuming and getting righteous and indignant about uh, about my responsibility and dealing with the banking system and how uh, I shouldn't be making these claims and I should be doing this and doing that. I remind him of a couple of things, just a couple of little thoughts. In the 1983 campaign, the member for Kuyong behind him said that if Labor, a Labor government is elected, there will be a run on the, the country's currency. And he went on saying that through the campaign. I didn't hear any bukes from the, le the, the then leader, uh, the then treasurer. I mean, I didn't hear any, any wailing in the opposition about irresponsibility, as we saw about three to four billion run out of the country in the week after the election, and which then all came back three weeks later, for which we then had to sterilise that amount in the money supply and offer then 13 to 15 per cent interest for 15 years on the Commonwealth budget. I didn't hear any uh, rebukes from that. 
uh, nor of uh, nor uh, I'm talking about responsibility. Uh, I mean, the member for Bennelong doesn't like being reminded, but he sat there and watched the Australian tax system hemorrhage badly for four years as treasurer. Now I've run the tax system, and you know, whenever there's a scam on, or whenever uh, the tax commissioner comes to you with a scheme of arrangement. This idea that you need to know the names of the people involved before you can make a move, that the secrecy provisions, that the secrecy provisions protect the treasurer from knowing about it is of course just poppycock. And that uh, I've I've now, on behalf of this government, tightened the tax system up to the point where we've got lower rates, higher compliance, proper audits and everything else. So when he gets to his feet, and we see the fulminations and the, uh, and the hyperbole and the rhetoric about responsibility, just uh, let me remind him before he starts that he had a big responsibility which he, which he didn't face up to. And to be sitting there, I would not wish that whenever it is to be that I leave this position, that someone would produce for me a telephone book of letters pleading with me to face my ministerial responsibilities to stop the tax system hemorrhaging. There's no letters like that in my files. I can tell you, there are none. And they can shake the place upside down over the years and not one will drop out. But there was a damn phone book full for you. So I mean, I face things in this country and I've got the job done as I've seen it at the time. And in 1986, the job was to fix the banking system up and one of the great areas of problem for all of us in the official family at the time was the state of the National Australia Bank and our fears about the savings bank of the National Australia Bank. And that was a part of the high motivation in repairing uh, the, uh, the then uh, structure of uh, banking regulations uh, and, uh, and uh, introducing the subsidy to keep the savings bank both lending for, for housing and keeping them viable. And if Mr Clark wants to stand on his uh, pedestal and throw muck at me or any other member of the government, he ought to remember that his pedestal's got a few chips and blemishes on it from his own strategy back in 1986. And that was the point I was making yesterday, not to, not to attack the viability of his institution, which is of course entirely viable, entirely viable, but which then wasn't, but which then wasn't, and uh, that uh, the reason that housing has been so strong ever since, and that Mr Clark would now have only about 15 or 16 per cent of regulated loans and the rest would be deregulated, is because of the changes which I introduced on that occasion. Now, this government has done more for banks in terms of the deregulation of the financial system, in terms of letting them bid for deposits to take their central place in the financial system, to lend for housing and to generally consolidate their interests than any other government in the past. And Mr Clark knows that well. But never do we ever receive ever any credit for it, only these tawdry attacks on the government, on me and on others. And I'm afraid it, uh, uh, Mr Clark will have to uh, be aware of the fact that there will be responses. But I must say of him, he doesn't complain. The complainants are others on his behalf, the people without the wit or the uh, courage to be able to even mount the kind of effort he has over his corporate life, and that's the members of the Liberal Party opposite. So, Mr Speaker, I don't regard this as a censure. I regard it as a joke from a group of people that, that let the banking system fall into disrepair and let these structural weaknesses appear by their, by their maintenance of a regulatory posture through the years they were the government. And it's only this government that's taken these issues on the chin Order. and made the Australian banking the system the sensible time has and expired. viable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable the Honourable Member for Bennelong. Uh, Mr um, Speaker, uh, during the uh, course of his speech, the uh, Treasurer had a number of quite telling things to say, but I think undoubtedly the most uh, telling thing that the Treasurer had to say during the course of his speech was when he said, and I think I quote him correctly because I would not like to do what he said an injustice, he said, this is all about the occasional spats between Nobby Clark and me. Well, let me say right at the outset to the Treasurer, and I think I would say it with the support of a large number of people, not only in this parliament but throughout the nation, we don't really mind how many spats you have with Nobby Clark. 
We don't mind how personal they become. We don't mind how abusive they become. And we are perfectly happy that Nobby Clark can look after himself and you can look after yourself. But in the course of having your spats with Nobby Clark, don't you go so far over the top as to put at risk the confidence of ordinary Australians in the stability of our financial system. Because, because, because Mr Speaker, that is, what, that is what this resolution is all about. It has absolutely nothing at all to do, nothing at all to do, Mr Speaker, with personal abuse. And as for this man, the arch perpetrator of personal abuse in this parliament, known throughout the nation not as the world's greatest treasurer, but as Australia's worst political abuser. This man's reputation as a political to, to, to almost say as he did today, look, look, you know, really, I was entitled to be annoyed because Nobby said something rude about me. What I say to the treasurer, what I say to the treasurer is simply this. You have your little spats with Nobby, have them with anybody you like in the business community, with your own colleagues and, and so on with us. But for heaven's sake, when it comes with the Prime Minister, with the Minister for Communications, but when it comes to your responsibilities as the Treasurer of this country, don't you play fast and loose with the confidence of ordinary Australians in the stability of our financial system. Because that is what this is all about. And and amazingly enough, it was the Treasurer himself who, in another mode, at another time, with another political agenda in front of him, actually impeccably stated the principle. And he said it in his press conference after he had, quote, saved the State Savings Bank of Victoria. And he said, the first thing I said was that my interest in this was for the stability of the financial system and that had to be guaranteed above everything else. Now, I say to the Treasurer that was an impeccable statement of his responsibilities. And I am prepared to accept, and I do accept, that the Treasurer knows precisely what his responsibilities are. Whatever I may think of some of his actions, whatever my views may be of him as a politician or as a participant in public life in Australia, he is no fool. He knows precisely what he says. And that, of course, makes what he said yesterday all the more culpable. Yes. He knew that to use the word insolvent, to borrow the expression of the former foreign minister, he was firing a lethal bullet. He knew that. And he did it, he did it quite deliberately. And he did it quite callously. And that's why he deserves the censure of this parliament. If he had got up and he had simply given Nobby a serve, well, that would have been the end of the matter. He'd have been entitled to do that. And Nobby being the man that many of us know him to be would have laughed it off and in a couple of weeks he'd have come back with another one. And that would have been hit back over the net. Well, that is fair enough. And that is the robust political exchange that most Australians uh, around the place don't mind on occasions provided the national interest doesn't get mangled in the process. And that is the kernel of this whole debate. You can have these exchanges, but if you start mangling the national interest, if you start playing fast and loose with words like insolvency, particularly at a time when people are legitimately concerned about the stability of certain financial institutions, the, the person who should be the last man left standing in Australia defending the stability of the system is the Federal Treasurer. Right. He shouldn't be the first person to invoke the careless epithet of insolvency to score a cheap political point. And this is precisely what this debate is all about. It is all about um, the eroding political position of the member for Blacksland. Because it's, it's observed. It's observed in the gallery. It's observed in the public galleries. It's observed all around the place, and it's being observed in the nation. It's all going wrong for the member for Blacksland. 
that long journey to the lodge that he started when, uh, when Laurie grabbed the ballot box and put it on the back of the motorbike uh, <laughs> back, uh, back in the 1960s. It's all going wrong. It's being derailed. And of course, it has come tragically apart over the last couple of weeks. You know, this was going to be the big week. This was going to be the, you know, the vintage performance. He was going to strut the stage not only as treasurer, not only as the victor of, uh, of over the left in relation to the Commonwealth Bank, but he was also going to be the acting Prime Minister of Australia. But it is a token of his increasing sensitivity, his growing political vulnerability, the realisation that it's slipping aside, that his judgment deserts him. And he believes that he can indulge in the sort of hyperbole and downright uh, irresponsibility that he indulged in yesterday. And this is the man who only the week before had said this in reply to the acting leader of the opposition. It is a monstrous slur on the Reserve Bank of Australia by the deputy leader of the opposition and his Victorian colleague Kennett to suggest, as he put it, that the Reserve Bank advised anybody to let a financial institution go. Well, let me plagiarise and paraphrase for a moment, Mr Speaker. Let me say to the Treasurer that it is a monstrous exercise of irresponsibility by you to cast a slur on the National Bank of Australia. Yeah. It is a monstrous thing for you to suggest that one of the most respectable institutions in this country was on the brink or had in fact gone into insolvency when you knew well better than anybody else that it hadn't. And nothing that you can say today, nothing you have said today at question time or in response to this censure motion or will say from now while you've breath can alter the fact that you are prepared calculatedly for a cheap political advantage to play fast and loose with the truth and run the risk of undermining the confidence of ordinary people in the stability of our financial system. And you can walk out, you can sneer and guffaw, but you can't walk away from that grim reality. Because at the end of the day, when you've been treasurer of this country for seven and a half years, you've got to face up to a few basic responsibilities. <coughs> but let me go on. But let me go on. Let me go on. He can't. I mean, here is, here is the man who has dished out more personal abuse. And, and nobody has been in greater receipt of that personal abuse than me. Right. Nobody has in this parliament. And what does he do now? He, he scuttles like the political coward he has become from this parliament. And this is the man, this is the man, this is the man who only, who only last week had this to say. And he said this once again in reply to my colleague, the acting leader of the opposition. If he has anything to say, he should say it by way of a substantive motion instead of making these unsubstantiated smears and slurs. And listen to this. Against honourable people who are running decent institutions. Let me again say to the Treasurer, if you have anything substantial to say, why don't you do it by substantive motion instead of making slurs against honourable people who run decent institutions like the National Bank of Australia? Yeah. Once again, the Treasurer's own words have come back to haunt him and to remind him of the degree of his irresponsibility. But there's one other aspect of this matter that I'd like to deal with, and it goes to the very heart of the Treasurer's pathetic defence and that is that he really did, after all, save the National Bank because back in 1986 the government gave an interest rate subsidy. Well, I remember the circumstances of 1986 very well because in 1985, when I was Leader of the Opposition, it was the policy of the Opposition to totally deregulate interest rates on all loans. And that was a policy that we had argued for very strongly because we thought it was economically rational. It was then and it still is. <laughs> uh, well, let's go back to the Peloponnesian Wars. <laughs> or, we can, or, we, you know, or, we can, or we can or we can go back to John Curtin. Anyway, we argued, we put this forward as a policy, put this forward as a policy, and of course the Labor Party ran a very successful political campaign against it. 
in the scare campaign, smear campaign against it in the course of the South Australian election in 1985. Now let me say to the Treasurer and to the Prime Minister, it was a very successful political campaign. You achieved your objective. You scared the daylights out of the Australian people to the effect that any lifting of that ceiling would cause uh, you know, devastation and ruin for ordinary Australians. You got 10 out of 10 for politics, but you got zero out of 10 for the national interest. Once again, you were prepared to run cheap politics, and that was the reason why you had a crisis at the beginning of 1986 in relation to the provision of housing loans. And that subsidy scheme that was introduced was part of a total package. And it was announced by the Treasurer and the Honourable Stuart West, and it included the payment of these subsidies to the banks. The Treasurer would now have you believe that that subsidy was specially devised to help the National Bank of Australia. It wasn't. That subsidy was, in fact, contributed to as to one third by the banks themselves. In other words, two thirds of the money was put in by the government and one third was put in by the banks. And the purpose of that subsidy, let me remind the House, was to ensure that the banks could maintain their existing portfolio of old loans at 13.5 per cent. In other words, it was a policy decision by the government to make it possible for the banks to maintain. It had nothing to do with the solvency of the National Bank of Australia or indeed any other bank. And let, me, let me read from a document that was released at the time. And it was released at the time under the cover of the Treasurer's office. And it says, the following is a draft text of a leaflet being prepared on the government's housing decision for use in answering queries. And it has this to say, and it goes very directly to the difference between profitability and insolvency. And it goes very directly to the calculated irresponsibility of the Treasurer in what he said yesterday, because it was his scheme. And this is his statement. This is what it had to say. It is true the banks have been profitable in recent years, but it is also true that the savings bank arms had become unprofitable at the beginning of this year. No reference there to the National Bank, a general reference to the fact that there was a profitability problem. Of course there was a profitability problem. If you can only charge 13.5 per cent and you've got to borrow at 15, you'll soon have a profitability problem. And that's what it was all about. And that is why they devised the subsidy. They didn't decide to devise the subsidy to rescue Nobby or to rescue Westpac. They devised it as part of an overall scheme. And it then went on to say that the savings bank arm had become unprofitable at the beginning of this year. Banks are not in a position to lend money for less than it is costing them to borrow. A fair statement of the position. Nothing to do with Nobby, nothing to do with the technical or other um, described insolvency of the National Bank. It was all about a government policy decision in relation to housing finance. And it is a total misrepresentation of the facts for the Treasurer to come into this House and to pretend that the subsidy scheme was in some way devised to bail out Nobby. So not only is he guilty of irresponsibly throwing around words like insolvency, not only has he fallen short of the standards he so impeccably set forth only two weeks ago when he was talking about the takeover of the State Savings Bank of Victoria, but for good measure he's once again in the business of trying to rewrite political and economic history in Australia. I believe, Mr Speaker, this will be the week that will record when well and truly to more and more of his colleagues, and not just the member for Robertson and his ilk, but many others in the Labor Party, when it all started to come apart for the member for Blacksland and when the realisation that that, uh, that dream is not going to be realised. The Honourable Leader of the House. Well, the, uh, one thing is absolutely certain out of today's debate is we struggle to find 15 minutes' worth of material to fill in on the uh, substance of the, uh, of the argument that the opposition has put forward. And, uh, and, and that is this, that uh, the Treasurer will emerge with his reputation and record, as far as his incumbency as that office is concerned, completely intact. This was a got-up motion by the opposition, a motion not pursued in any way systematically through the period of question time. You know, this, this, 
particular resolution is supposed to have been justified by a series of parliamentary tactics designed to elucidate a series of facts to embarrass the Treasurer, was preceded with what? Questions, or questions to me on whether or not I would uphold the uh, findings of the environmental impact statement on, uh, on what's going to happen to the third Sydney runway. Questions to my, questions to my deputy minister on whether or not he, uh, he liked uh, a decision to shift the uh, Maritime Safety Authority to Newcastle. Numerous other questions to other people on this front bench. Oh, and by the way, as an afterthought, as an afterthought, uh, we have, of course, the treasurer abusing his position, abusing the, uh, the, uh, the uh, calling into question the solvency of the banking system, calling into question the integrity of a uh, of a prominent official in the private banks. Oh, we'll get onto that in the last couple of questions in question time, and then we'll stand the house on its head with a censure on that matter, as though we have assigned it the sort of appropriate priority that a censure motion normally deserves. That is what you think. That is what you think of the relevance. That is what you think of the relevance of the things that you're putting forward here in this parliament. That is what you think of the substance of your claims on the treasurer. That is what you think is uh, is a matter that ought to occupy the time of this parliament. Now, the previous speaker who just sat down made a great great deal he felt about the uh, integrity of the treasurer on these matters. Well, I, I'm I'm getting fond in this house of recalling last acts of, uh, of, of uh, ministers on the way out, because so many of them want to be back on the way in. And uh, I had occasion yesterday to refer to the last uh, press release of the then Minister for Communications in 1983. And I have occasion now, I think, to refer to the last budget of the, uh, of the person here challenging the, the integrity of the Treasurer on, uh, on uh, his, uh, his prudent management of the economy. You produced a budget, your last budget, which, as far as the secretary of your department was concerned, was deeply dishonest. Deeply dishonest on what it claimed to be the like, what was claimed to be the likely impact of the outlays. A, a four billion dollar hole was there in your budget. A four billion dollar hole on your predictions, and you were warned about that by your you were warned about that by the secretary of your treasury, and your secretary of the treasury at the time. And you come in here talking about uh, these events as though there is some degree of, uh, of, a, uh, of justification in your position. Well, let, let us go just to the facts that are entailed here in this censure motion. So thin has been your argument, so thin has been your argument to the actual substance of the censure motion. You've spent your time perambulating around the economy with a whole series of unfounded, unproven assertions, and certainly no assertions that you've bothered to test here in question time for the last couple of weeks that have been available to you. No assertions as far as that's concerned. But uh, let's go nevertheless to the nub of it and so that at least there is a, a speaker in this House, apart from the Treasurer, who has found himself obliged in this debate to actually deal with what is contained in the opposition censure motion. We'll get nobody dealing with it on the other side of the House. But let's get to, let's get to the guts of this. Firstly, Contrary to claims, the Treasurer released no confidential information. None. There was no confidential information released as far as the, uh, the position of the National Australia Bank was concerned. Secondly, there was no information released to which he had privileged access. All that the Treasurer mentioned was well known in the community at the time, it's been well known in subsequent commentaries. And so, uh, so there is no that there is no, well, you have presented no evidence to the contrary, my friend, and you are supposed to in here be on the attack. You are supposed to here be on the attack, and you have presented no evidence. What the Treasurer drew on was common knowledge about the economic history of, the, of, of 1986. Now, you may not know it, but anybody with a reasonable knowledge of the Australian economy knows what happens in 1986. The last half of the, uh, of, the, of the last speaker from the opposition attempted to deal with, uh, with that particular issue by claiming that what was done by the government to deal with the crisis in, uh, in, the, in housing lending back in 1986 was not done particularly to advantage Nobby Clark, and, uh, and that therefore, because it was not done particularly to advantage Nobby Clark or save Nobby Clark or whatever, that that constitutes in some way a rebuttal of what are the points that the Treasurer is making. What a load of nonsense. 
What was done then in 1986, the subsidy that was introduced and the other measures that were taken at the time to lift the ceiling, was to deal with the fact that the banks had found themselves in a situation where they had on their hands a lending crisis because they could not sustain that 13.5 per cent rate without effectively ceasing housing lending. Sure, that applied to all banks, but it applied, it applied with knobs on to knobbies because uh, the situation in which he found himself was that he was shelling out loans as fast as he could, faster than anyone else in the banking system, a well-known fact at the time, faster than anyone else. Sure, all banks were affected. All banks would, uh, would, uh, would, would benefit from the decisions that were taken, but the point was that Nobby's bank benefited the most because he alone among the bankers had taken the decision at the time that he would shovel that, shovel that money out in anticipation that the government would do a retrospective change to the fixed interest rate uh, situation. Now, no decent government, given the longevity of those fixed interest rates on housing, could ever make a retrospective decision in relation to housing. There are a certain amount of proprieties in relation to contractual arrangements entered into people with their, by people with their bankers albeit on the terms and conditions prevailing at the time. Now, the fact of the matter is very large numbers of Australians had entered into arrangements with their banks, calculated their decisions about purchasing their housing in anticipation that they were going to receive a 13.5 per cent interest rate. And people were taking those decisions, looking at their income and saying, yes, I can afford that. Now, no decent government is going to march into the middle of this situation and say, right, shop. Whatever personal arrangements you've established with your banker, we are now going to turn it on its head and you're going to get 16 per cent. It's another matter for another person who wants to rearrange their finances or who subsequently wants to enter the housing market to, uh, to then make it on a calculation based on the fact that he knows, he or she knows, that the bank is then in a situation or to be in a situation where they may move interest rates around. Well, they can make their calculation. They can take their punt. And what we said back then was, from this point on, when you enter into that relationship with your banker, if you don't actually get a specific fixed-term interest rate from him, then you are entering into a field where you will be taking a punt on this matter. That is your free choice. That is not a free choice that the opposition ever presented anyone in this country when they were in office. It was a free choice we presented them. And the beneficiaries of that free choice were several uh, were, were several sets of people. One set of people, and they are, I must admit they're the only ones that we are particularly worried about, was the, uh, were the potential home owners of the time who wished to be in a position to be able to make a decision in that regard. And I noticed one of my uh, uh, colleagues uh, raised his hand to indicate that he was one person in that, in that category. Well, that is what we decided to do at the time, and we were most concerned about them. But picked up on the way through were people about whom we were less concerned. And one of those was Nobby Clark, who happened to have made a Ill, an ill-advised decision as far as his bank was concerned about his bank's lending policies. Now, that is all that the Treasurer said yesterday. All he said yesterday effectively was this, that he had made a series of decisions which, if the situation had persisted, his, po his, his position in his savings bank was unviable. And if the situation had persisted, and indeed well, there might have been a 30 million profit in that year, in the subsequent year it certainly would not have been 30 million dollars profit. If that position had persisted, uh, then that, uh, that 1986 decision on the banker of the year might well not have been a decision that would have been uh, very safely made at all. But then we had the bleating from the, uh, the former leader of the opposition when he came in and said, well, uh, we of course, I well remember that period. Well, 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 he might remember that period as this government struggled with the consequences of his policies in a myriad areas, but he particularly chose to remember the period uh, from the point of view of the fact that he said he would totally deregulate interest rates as far as the housing sector was concerned and expressed hurt that the government of the day would not permit him to do that with people who had already in entered into contractual arrangements effectively with their bankers on a 13.5 per cent interest rate. That devastatingly wrongful government that had come in and, uh, and upset the apple cart by not agreeing with him that that's what we ought to do, and subsequently went into the only sensible way, you, a decent way, you could deregulate those roads. He said, of course, our opposition policy at that point of time was to totally deregulate. That's 1985. 
1986, two years after they were in office, two years after his seven-year tenure in the Treasury. And hasn't it always been the way since we've been in office? Hasn't it always been the way? We are the people who have had to sit in government introducing microeconomic reform, anteing up with a decent wages policy and copying the sort of criticism that we get from the opposition whenever it is we choose to do something in this regard. And they're always the cases of you have loved us lately. I remember the struggle we had to go through or the Treasurer had to go through to put in place a decent amount of assets testing related to welfare policies. The, the election after election we had to fight explaining that while you came in against it. We even now have to confront the possibility, because of your shenanigans in the Senate, that there's going to be a hole punched in the, in the integrity of our, of our outlays calculation by your not being able to face up to another thing as far as people's uh, uh, tax file numbering issues are concerned. You take every time you're presented with an opportunity, you've always taken the easy way out since you have been in opposition and it has been we who have had to confront the problems and the consequences of that. And so it is now on interest rates and wages policy. For the last year and a half, while the opposition has been parading itself around this country, saying that it is the party of small business, it is the party concerned about what is happening to the living standards of the average Australian, it is the party that wants to see families able to build their sound economic future without confronting, the, confronting interest rate burdens. It is nevertheless the party who, in every policy parameter they put down, though they will not admit it is the consequence of it, every one has stated that what they are going to do is to effectively raise interest rates. Their wages policy is raise interest rates. Raise interest rates crash the economy through the floor, ensure that there's a high level of unemployment and establish a degree of control over, uh, over union wages claims on the basis of that. That is that party which invites us, that never admits it, but everybody who's an economic analyst in this country knows that that is their intention. Some economic analysts approve of it, some do not, but the ordinary people in this country who have to confront the consequences of these are instead presented with a farrago of nonsense from the Liberal Party, a farrago of nonsense saying that those sorts of things are a product of government policy and not their intention, not what they would do if they ever found themselves in the situation when uh, they were in office. And when it comes to an opposition criticising a Treasurer that has taken our percentage of uh, outlays uh, to GDP down from something like 30 per cent where you left it down to 23 and, as I said, every step of the way, you harrying and snapping at his heels, he is invited to contemplate the fact that you believe that he's mangled the national interest in this regard. I see that uh, uh, one of the culprits of, in national interest mangling is uh, going to succeed me in this debate, and he will have an opportunity. Where he'll have a, he will have an opportunity when he uh, he gets up on his scrapers to explain to us how he managed to run the 1983 uh, uh, 83 campaign on the sort of single parroted line that we were going to, there would be a run on the currency if Labor was elected. And while he's at it, he can also, uh, he can also have an explanation of it for his then leader at the time who said that uh, if Labor got elected, you'd have to put your savings in a shoebox. So the, uh, so the position, these are the, people, these are the people who come in this place parading, who come in this place parading their rectitude as far as, uh, as far as economic policy is concerned. Well, the Treasurer needs no defence in this House against the likes of you. The Treasurer needs no defence in this House against the sort of unprincipled behaviour you've been guilty of both in government and in opposition. He will get a defence in this House, however, by this people on this side of the House because of the immense respect that we hold him for the job that he has had to do in the face of the mess that you made of the economy through something like 30 years of tenure in office. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those with that opinion, please. The Honourable Member for Kuyon. Mr Speaker. There is one single element that uh, would be agreed upon by the overwhelming majority of Australians listening to this debate. It would be that the minister who just spoke didn't have his heart in it. <laughs> didn't have his heart in it. He didn't fool a soul. The two of them have been at one another for weeks and to hell with the national interest, to hell with the programs and the blueprints and the schedules. Of course, the fellow who follows me that minister, he'll be right in it because he wants to be treasurer. And you know who he's backing. 
But the portly gaseous. Oh, no. You did. You sure didn't get the strong defence today coming from either the heart or the head. And the fact is, what is before the parliament as a censure motion is in fact, save and except for a censure on a government, the most important resolution that the opposition can move in the parliament. And it's about standards. It's about standards. They know it, we know it, and the people outside know it. But they know, with the acting Prime Minister, the Treasurer, they just can't achieve those standards. Very interesting article <coughs> in the front of the Sydney Morning Herald today. I'll only read a very small portion of it by Paul Cleary, in which he says, quote, at a time when public confidence in the financial system is near rock bottom, the Treasurer yesterday made an extraordinary claim not my words, their words, extraordinary claim that the government had been forced to prop up the National Australia Bank in 1986 because its savings bank had become, quote, insolvent, end of quote. Let's just get it on the record again right at the outset of my remarks. The National Australia Savings Bank has never been and is not and was not insolvent. Now, why would a man do this? Why would a Treasurer, and indeed with the additional garb of Acting Prime Minister, do it? The member for Benelong was right. This resolution is fundamentally about the responsibility of a Treasurer to the financial system of our country and to the people of Australia. He knows his responsibility, but he never carries them out. And let me, in light of that, just quote one more element from this article in the Sydney Morning Herald today. It goes on in the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph to say, Mr Keating, who has been threatening to use his insolvency comments for more than a year, and then goes on to quote, premeditated attack. To hell with the truth, to hell with the consequences, either for a bank or for the shareholders in the bank, and to hell with the people of Australia striking at the financial system in this way. Now, I would have said that nothing reveals the cowardice of this man more than he's skulking out of this chamber before, temporarily returning to hear Cassius do a phony job in defence, <laughs> recognising what a facade it was out again and possibly not to be seen for the remainder of this debate. But when you recognise that it was premeditated, calculated. then calculated, premeditated, no, no rush of blood to the head, just get at someone. And why? Because he dared to criticise him. <laughs> now, I heard uh, one of our speakers, I think it was the acting leader of the opposition, say, that uh, if the Treasurer will go outside the confines uh, of the Treasury or this Parliament or his own residence, wherever that may be these days, <laughs> and he seems to have a less idea than me, if he were to go outside, he would hear the people of Australia saying the sorts of things that Nobby Clark said. And I recall saying before the election campaign, have a look at it. You won't see him out in the supermarkets. You won't see him in the pubs. You won't see him with the people of Australia because he just won't mingle with them. More than that, even in his own vehicle in Sydney, when he does deign to drive through that city, he's got dark and glass in the vehicle. I'm never quite sure whether it's so that people can't see him or by the way he behaves, whether he doesn't have to see people. But the reality is, out there, in the greater part of this nation of ours, they know that this man is a failure, and they know the innate truth in what Nobby Clark was saying about him, because you know the impact of the diminished living standards of Australians today, and notwithstanding additionally the fragility of the financial system that uh, abounds now 
this man in a premeditated, dirty political stunt with but one aim in mind, to get at someone who had had a go at him, cast aside the truth, the system, the consequences and, frankly, the people's interest. And he's been condemned universally for it. And if you had any guts in here and if you put your mind to it, you'd come over with us today and vote on this. Because there are a fair number of you who'd like to do it anyhow. A fair number. But just as he's shown the characteristics of the coward in fleeing from the chamber today, so he was in making the premeditated attack on Nobby Clark because he couldn't hack the criticism. And as I say, what Nobby said is said by most Australians. If you go in the streets, go in anywhere, you can see it. And you can see, therefore, for those of you who might perchance be undecided about the leadership of your party and its decline, you can see what a grubby Prime Minister the man would be. The Business Council earlier this week was abused, was accused of incompetence and hypocrisy, words that must be emblazoned on his mind when he coddles his own conscience, but trotted them out earlier this week. Now, I think, in terms of the material that uh, the minister who uh, spoke after the member for Benelong trotted out, about the state of the Australian economy during the period of the Fraser government. Let me just say that I recall as Foreign Minister for the greater part of that period, at one point being asked by my Prime Minister to consider whether Australia could be admitted to what is colloquially termed the G7, though its foundations weren't that, the leading members of the Western industrialised uh, economies, the best, meet together annually at head of government level. And I was charged with the responsibility of seeing those heads of government to see whether they would consider admitting Australia to the G7. All agreed, bar one, which wanted to think about it. While it was thinking about it, the Prime Minister then changed his mind and believed that we ought not at this juncture go ahead with that. Now, I put it to you, if you suggested anywhere in the world today that Australia be considered for membership of the G7, you'd be laughed out of court. Laughed out of court. Because our great country is deemed by most to be simply irrelevant. And in starker terms, it was seen in terms of the Gulf crisis itself had to knock on doors and make all the offers before we were even asked to make a contribution, passed over even in that domain, despite alliances. So you come in here and you talk about the strength of the Australian economy today and start making reflections as to what it was under us, and I tell you, no matter what comparative indice you make and use the uh, devices that you wheel out, you've got to conclude that under this man as Treasurer, whether on a macro test or a micro test, you have failed, and outside this building you have failed overwhelmingly the great majority of Australians. And we have had to tolerate for seven years this creature, hectoring and lecturing everybody about the need for care to avoid run-on state banks of Victoria or other elements of the financial institutions. And here he is attacking and casting aspersions on a bank in a most dangerous, premeditated and irresponsible manner. And not only is it delinquency in terms of the Treasurer himself, but in terms of one who aspires to be the Prime Minister, it just underlines how unsuited he is for that task. Oh yeah, a fix-it man. Oh sure, you want a little job done, he'll stitch it up for you. As uh, the member for Benelong said, grab, grab the ballot boxes and go on the motorbike in those days. <laughs> Challenges to the endorsement, you trace the record of the man. The record of the man is always involving breaches of standards. And if I wanted to get personal as I can on censure motions, you know the sorts of things I could raise about him since he's been Treasurer. 
from tax returns, through to shonky visas, through to shonky travelling allowances. At every turn and twist in this man's career, it's been just that, a turn and a twist and a breaching of standards. And he comes in here and lectures the people of Australia about the sanctity of the system that if someone criticises him will tear it down no matter the consequence to simply get back. Premeditated attack. The remarks yesterday, you'll recall after all, were moved from insolvent to then technically insolvent to then going insolvent to then in need of liquidation. I don't know. I mean, frankly, if I were going to do a, do a demolition on a broke, I may, I may do a, a bomb in the basement, but this endeavour to brick by brick demolition was motivated by what? What motivated? Was it the facts? No, it wasn't. It was ego and arrogance that anybody in this democracy could so criticise him about his performance and the state of the Australian economy today that you would jeopardise the financial system and jeopardise the well-being of your people simply to strike back at the person who accused you of this. I have never known in my period here such hypocrisy such ingratiation to his own ambitions to strike out in the manner that he has. I suppose to attack Nobby Clark is one thing. He's a reasonably tough guy and the Treasurer himself uh, concedes that. But attacking a bank, attacking a major bank, is just basically irresponsible and at a time when the market is as fragile as it is. It's interesting to recall that the time that he is referring to in 1986, the time that he's referring to was the time under his own stewardship in May of that year when he said our country was on the verge of a banana republic. His words. And so he moves to say Nobby's savings bank went insolvent in 1986 and it was, quote, rescued by the Commonwealth of Australia. Now, that was a lie. That was a, that was a lie. It was a downright lie. You were a crook Order. when you first entered Order. the parliament. Order. The honourable gentleman to. will not use that phrase. Oh, no, I got into trouble with that once before. Um, <laughs> and I rapidly withdraw it as a consequence. Yeah. The standards you set when you first sought to enter this parliament were investigated by the federal executive of your party and they were found to be um, uh, lacking. <laughs> and since you have assumed the position of treasurer, not only have you destroyed those standards, you have been the mastermind in destroying the economy itself. Yeah, yeah. And little wonder, little wonder that uh, Nobby Clark was moved in the manner that he was. Well, I'll give you the pencil, my friend, and you go out and see how you can flog it. I haven't got shoelaces, and I don't think you'd last too long there, because as the people of Australia were saying round the nation only this morning, you've given pretty evident purpose indication of just what you do to small businesses anyhow. But at root, I end as I began. And the member for Bennelong struck the right note that this debate is about standards and responsibilities, about the responsibility of a treasurer to the financial system of Australia and thereby to the people of Australia. And, brother, have you failed it? Yeah. 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 Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Uh, Mr. Mr. De uh, Deputy Speaker, the, uh, the most uh, theatrical the last of this uh, tawdry little trio, uh, decided to make some classical allusions at the beginning of uh, his speech, referring to the juxtaposition of the two speakers who went before me. I might uh, do a similar thing with him in relation to uh, his role in the uh, leadership of the Liberal Party. And uh, whatever he might say about my good friend, the Minister for Transport and Communications and uh, the Treasurer, he, he must be the most notorious Brutus the Liberal Party has ever had. 
Not once, not once has he tried to, not once has he tried to uh, bring down a leader, but twice, once successfully, and with what such little effect that there has been. Some of, uh, of course, there are very few people in here who can recall the, the dramatic days of 1982, when the then, uh, or was it 81, when the then uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs came in here to resign his position to complain about his treatment at the hands of the then Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Fraser. And we listened uh, intently to the way in which he tried to drag his leader's reputation uh, through, uh, through the sewer. And uh, of course, we only had to wait a few more years to see him at it again, only this time as deputy leader of the Liberal Party, as uh, he made one of the most uh, cowardly pounces on uh, a leader when he decided to snatch the leadership of the Liberal Party from the, minister, from the member for uh, Benelong, uh, the, now, uh, Mr. the then leader, Mr Howard. So I don't think that the I think that the uh, the honourable member for Kuyong is probably in the worst position of all to make uh, to cast any aspersions on the uh, on the intentions or the behaviour of any of the political characters in Australia today. But I might say that if Nobby Clark uh, had wanted to have some legal defence in this little uh, travail that he's going through on this occasion. Uh, I'm sure that the three who have, we have seen here today, who have so eagerly yet maladroitly volunteered their services on his behalf, would not be the ones to receive Nobby Clark's brief. These were like the three stooges of suburban solicitation. And uh, what, appalling, what an appalling performance they put in, in defence of a man who uh, we all know to be uh, likeable, robust and uh, perfectly capable of looking after himself in the context of fairly vigorous uh, political debate which he chooses to engage in from time to time. But what is it we are arguing about here uh, today? What we are really talking about, and I think the, uh, the Treasurer has put it as succinctly as anyone, and that is, it is a bit of a spat between two of Bankstown's uh, most successful sons. One uh, who is in the twilight of his career, about to uh, amble off about to amble off into retirement, and the other one who is at the uh, pinnacle of his career and, uh, and, is, con and is, of course, going to strength, from strength to strength in the economic leadership of this country. And uh, that's what we're really talking about. So when you hear about these references to the national interest being assailed during the course of the interchange between the treasurer on the one hand and, uh, and the leader of a bank on another, of course you ought to put that in the political context in which, uh, in which it is made. But seeing as the uh, member for Benelong went to such uh, unctuous lengths, such unctuous lengths to uh, draw, these, uh, draw these threads of an attack on the national interest, I think it's worthwhile just uh, examining his and indeed some of his colleagues' character as far as the defence of the national interest is concerned. Now, of course, it goes without saying that uh, those in opposition have very few opportunities in which to uh, defend the national interest. The national interest is uh, something which it is the government's responsibility uh, to defend. But occasionally you can get insights into the behaviour and character of individuals, whether they are in government or in opposition, in terms of their true loyalty to this country and their preparedness to stand up for it and to stand up for it in spite, in spite of the political attraction of uh, abandoning it from time to time. And let's just examine a few of the activities, a few of the events in not such uh, dim, dark, uh, distant history in relation to these through three. Both of my colleagues have referred to the quite scandalous behaviour of the member for Kuyong when, as Minister for Industry and Commerce, in the lead-up to the 1983 election, he began to cast doubt on the, on the national currency. There can be no greater crime by any minister than to call into question the uh, validity, the, the security and the strength of the national character. It's all right for those who are outside, who have no particular responsibility, but at that time, when the, when the, uh, when the currency was being managed through a, through a process of regulation, which was uh, maintained by the former government, to have a minister casting doubt on the future of the currency. In fact, encouraging speculation against the currency that, 
is one of the greatest uh, instances of an abandonment of the national interest and a protection of the national interest. So that is where the, is where the uh, honourable member for Kuyong stands on that important test when he was a minister and had the opportunity. And I'll return to him a little later. Reference has also been made to the behaviour and the conduct and indeed the record of the member for Benelong when he was treasurer. His uh, conduct in relation to the defence of the taxation system, his, uh, his conduct in relation to budgeting, when in not one of his budgets came in on target. But there is one even greater instance of his hypocrisy and, might I say, dishonesty, and that is in, the re in relation to the last couple of weeks of the election campaign of 1983, when he was informed, informed by the Secretary of the Treasury that the forthcoming budget deficit in prospect was, ni uh, was $9.6 billion, and yet he allowed his leader, and indeed he himself, went on saying that the prospective deficit was indeed just $6 billion. A quite deliberate $3.6 billion error, which he was aware of, and yet he allowed that truth not only to be denied the electorate at a time when they were making a decision about the future of the government, but also encouraged or at least permitted his leader to continue to uh, pro pro proclaim and pretend that the deficit in prospect was six billion when in fact he knew that it was going to be $9.6 billion. That is a measure of that man's uh, understanding of what it means to defend the national interest, what it means to stand up principally at a time of, uh, of uh, political uh, travail. And then, uh, of course, we all remember his conduct in 1986 as leader of the opposition when, uh, as he normally was, under some considerable pressure, tried to look for some, some chink in which he might be able to uh, grease his way into office in this country. And so, from some fashionable New York hotel, he said with some uh, undeniable conceit, unconcealable conceit, he told a journalist there that the times would suit him. In other words, the prospects in front of the Australian economy were so bleak that they would uh, herald his election or at least would herald the defeat of this government. So what, what, could, what greater sabotage could there be in terms of the interests of the Australian economy than for the alternate Prime Minister, not even in Australia, but in New York, to say that the economy was so bad that it would even likely to lead to his election. And uh, what, uh, what more graphic illustration of a calamity could there be than something which was so great which would lead to his inevitable elevation uh, to the prime ministership? So this is the kind of uh, history of these people who now come in here with uh, such disgraceful unction trying to talk, uh, trying to lecture us and most particularly the Treasurer about the questions of the protection of the national interest. I won't uh, go in great detail to the circumstances of the last election when the member for Kuyong was the leader and the now deputy leader of the opposition was the spokesman on education. But uh, we only have to know at their, at their tawdry attempt to try and deceive the National Catholic Education Commission that they were in fact going to provide them with an additional $300 million to support their schools, whereas at the same time they were publicly saying and threatening to cut spending in the education area where they were trying to pretend that their election promises were fully costed. So these people come to this debate not only, not only with, uh, without clean hands, but I would say with an appalling reputation in terms of their own personal integrity and in terms of their own contribution to uh, political debate. But I want to return to what it is uh, that Mr Clark said. Mr Clark is, of course, a distinguished uh, banker. He is one of the, one of the, uh, major, uh, one of the, le the leader of one of the major banks in this country. And does he expect his comments to just be cast off? Does he make commentary on the national economy just in order to be ignored? Or does he make these comments in order that some people might take notice of what he is saying? And let's recall what it is he actually said that, uh, that of course, the Treasurer was entitled to take uh, such offence. He said, if I had the strike rate of my friend in Canberra, referring to the Treasurer, 
and had the economy in tatters because of, because of ineffective monetary management, then I'd be out selling pencils and so on. In other words, here is one of the, here is one of the people who is uh, perhaps most uh, qualified to comment on the circumstances of the national economy, saying that it is in tatters. And I was reminded of this because uh, on, the, on the AM program this morning, Mr Clark said, oh, it's all right to engage in a bit of uh, personal abuse. He's used to that. He can, he can handle the hurly-burly of, uh, of political debate. It's one thing for the Treasurer to, make, uh, to, to uh, say critical things of he, Mr Clark, but it's an entirely different thing for him to cast any aspersions on his institution, i.e. the National Australia Bank. But let's turn that on its head for a moment. Was, was the head of the National Australia Bank, in saying that the economy was in tatters, referring in a personal way to the Treasurer? Of course he was in the sense that he went on to talk about pencils and shoelaces. But in a sense he was talking about the institution of Australia, the Australian economy. And what was his evidence for saying that the Australian economy was in tatters. His only evidence was that he believed that there, be, there, there had been ineffective monetary management. Now, what are, what are his prescriptions? What are his prescriptions for the overall management of the economy? What, are his, what is his actual evidence for the fact that the economy is in tatters? I'm not going to go through a, uh, through a recitation of the enormous achievements which have been made in Australia. On the fiscal side, achievements which have not been equalled by any country in the world, achievements on the wages front, which make the, which make the record in the United States and Britain just pale into insignificance, achievements in, uh, in general deregulation of the economy, which of course make the record of our opponents pale into insignificance and of course uh, leave most of the rest of the world in the shade as well. But uh, leaving aside those great achievements, one uh, needs to recall that uh, what we are now pursuing is a policy designed to correct an unsustainably high foreign de uh, for current account deficit and, of course, deal with the threat of inflation. Now, where is Mr Clark's prescription for handling inflation? Where is Mr Clark's prescription for dealing with the current account? Where is Mr Clark's prescription for dealing with, uh, for having a sensible wages policy. All these issues have, of course, been left to the government and most particularly to the Treasurer. Where is the assistance that this uh, sometimes quite frequently solitary figure has from those who are by and large the beneficiaries of the success of economic policy in this country? The success measured in terms of huge investment and reinvestment in the Australian private economy a restoration of profit levels in the, in the private economy, a, uh, a, a curtailment or a, or a stability in wages outcome, which has never, been has never been seen in this country during a period of relatively sustained growth as we have had in this country over recent times. Mr Clark and his colleagues should be out uh, in a chorus of approval, should be a chorus of applause for the Treasurer and his achievements during the stewardship of, uh, of his period as Treasurer. And it ill behoves Mr Clark, I believe, to make these snide comments about uh, the Treasurer. And of course he can take them, he will take them, and he will respond to them in an appropriate uh, fashion. But for anyone to suggest that it is Mr Clark somehow who is defending the national interest, or it is this, uh, this uh, array of galahs on the other side who are responsible for protecting the national interest, and not the Treasurer, simply has been asleep for the last uh, eight years. It is the Treasurer who has been the one who has rescued this country and put it on a basis on which this country can prosper in the future. And that lesson should be recalled, that lesson should be remembered by those in the business community who might enjoy these little spats. I move oh, that the question be put. Order. <clears throat> the question is that the question be now put. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. All those with that opinion, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the noes. Edwards and Fisher Peter Anderson Shack and Gallus Charles Gallus Charles and Bradley's Gallus Charles and Bradley's Got better than the other side. It's improved.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 58, noes 64. The division is resolved in the negative. Will honourable members please resume their seats? Honourable members, please re resume their seats or leave the chamber. The honourable member for Gilmore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek to uh, ask you a question, and what I seek to do is to get your advice in relation to what ministers are responsible for here during question time. My question to you is that. Are ministers responsible for their own statements and are they responsible for matters that relate to legislation which they introduced into this House in recent times? And my reason for asking that, Mr Speaker, is that uh, earlier today during question time I asked a question of the Minister for Land Transport which related to a comment or comments that he had made himself in the last week and also related to legislation which he introduced into this House a few weeks ago. The minister answered the question by saying it was not a matter which fell under his portfolio responsibility. I ask you, what are the responsibilities of ministers during question time? So, stand, the answer to the honourable member's question is that Standing Order 142 provides that questions may be put to a minister relating to public affairs with which he is officially connected, to proceedings pending in the House or to any other matter of administration for which he is responsible. It, the, my recollection of the, st of the way the question time has progressed is that, that uh, matters asked of ministers can be answered by the Prime Minister, matters asked of the Prime Minister can be referred to a minister, but ministers only answer questions that relate to their own portfolio, not to someone else's portfolio. I suppose they could attempt to answer them relating to someone else's portfolio, but it would be uh, probably to their folly and detriment if they attempted to do so. The Honourable Member for Mallee. I wish to address a question to you. Mr Speaker, prior to the introduction of computerisation and other forms of modern technology, the daily Hansard was delivered to members' offices by 10am the day following debate. The last Hansard delivered to my office, and I assume other members of this House, was that of the Wednesday the 12th of last week. What are the problems with Hansard production, and when can members expect to see this problem rectified or the process privatised? <laughs> well, I, th I, think, I think one of the problems that we're facing at present is the change in the process. That, that present, uh, there is a, a significant change occurring in the way the Hansard is produced and the way that the parliament transmits its information to the government printing office with a computerisation of a lot of those processes. There has been some industrial action at the printing office, which has occurred just at the stage when we were finally bedding down the new uh, system. It's a matter that the uh, Secretary of the uh, Parliamentary Reporting Staff Department has a, uh, a great uh, deal of interest in, and it's a matter that's of some concern to the President and myself we believe that when this new um, process that we're putting into place is properly in operation, that there'll be a far more timely uh, uh, delivery of handsards to members, and it will provide a far better service, which uh, hopefully in the uh, medium term will be an on-screen service rather than having to wait uh, till the next day till you get handsard. But I, because of the problems that uh, there have been in this last week or so. I've spoken to the Secretary of the Department of the Parliamentary Reporting Staff, who is preparing a letter that I will circulate to members in the next week or in the next week back in members' electorate offices. So I thank the member for his question.
papers, the Leader of the House. Speaker, papers and tables listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in Hansard in the votes and proceedings.